Today we're going to be looking at the Cities and Towns book that just released from Cobalt Press. They were kind enough to give me a copy. And I spent, I thought I would spend like five minutes looking at it and be like, all right, cool, whatever. I was engrossed in this for over an hour, ended up going to bed super late because I was reading through it and how good it is. And what Cobalt Press has done, and their writers, is created a system for you to just kind of go through in a very, very well laid out thought process that allows you to create a city that feels real. It feels lived in, it feels like it has a purpose, it asks you a bunch of prompts and questions, it has a few tables that we can roll against, and it's just fantastic. Uh, there you go. TLDR, don't want to read, don't want to watch, it's just really good. We're going to go through the process of creating a city uh, that we've never created before. We're going to see what it's going to produce for us, and we're going to write it down, and we're going to see what we end up with. This is all in chapter one. The, the origins of the city, the purpose of the city, all those things, and then there's there are five chapters? Let's look at it. There are many chapters, and they're all fantastic. Alright, city planning. It gives you five questions around the city, which are how old is the city, what does it do, what does it trade, the size, and what's the government? How much magic matters in the city? How, how prevalent it is? How is it something that everybody has access to? Boswell, thank you for the follow. Is it something that everybody has access to, like sort of in an Eberron style where it's very endemic and it's everywhere? Or is it something that's severely restricted and then therefore has an impact on the city? So, does everybody have access to food because they could just create water and food all the time and nobody goes hungry? Or is it something that's only for the elite or even completely not there at all? And it's just chapter one, by the way. Chapter two goes over the geography and the climate, how to map a city, how to make it look organic. just the building blocks of a city, and all the districts that are going to be in there. And it goes in great detail, and I, like I said, I spent a lot of time reading it. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so good. I wish I had this when I was building my own uh, world. I had to do this all from scratch. This takes a lot of the, um, you know, what comes next, and did I miss anything? You just really go step by step. Then you go into the people of the city. Who rules the city? Who, um, you know, this form of like, uh, based on what you had earlier and one of the earlier things, uh, what's the form of rulership of the city? And then the officials, the families, the guilds that exist in it. And it is really, really good. Then we go through the city campaigns. What might exist within the city? Uh, what adventures might happen in here? The job boards that might exist? The encounter types? And then finally, the city heroes that might exist in there. Woof! Some really, really, really good stuff. So, we're going to start with chapter one, city planning. And we're going to answer what we're going to do today on the stream for the first part before we jump into uh, dark and darker Dungeons and Dragons is city planning. And we're going to answer the five questions and we're going to end up spitting out a city. The art's really good, by the way. By the way, very good art. Circle of the Cir I was there. Um, there are yes, there are a couple of uh, there's a couple there are a few player options, class options, and there are a few backgrounds as well. So to answer the earlier question, is this the GM or player book only? Players can absolutely get this. Like I think there's a lot of value for players to get this because you get player options. Uh, we can look at one of them. Tell you what, at the end we can look at one of them, and you guys tell me which of the ones, and I'll put it up to you to decide which one you want to look at, between the Bard Ch College of Chicanery, the Community Domain, the Circle of the Dru uh, the Sewer, which was really funny or, and good, the Rake, um, the Way of Leaps and Bounds, which is sort of, uh, I think I, I perused that one pretty quickly, but it's sort of like a parkour uh, version of the Monk, the Oath of Revolution, the Urban Ranger, which sort of slots in... Um, and like almost, there is, in the original D&D book, there's the uh, uh, the bounty hunter. And it's like an urban bounty hunter, a city guard kind of vibe. This is sort of in the same lines. There's the skirmish surgeon, which is a, a fighter medic. And then there's street magic. If you want to be David Blaine, uh, you time-traveling demon, uh, you can be that as well. In a fantasy game world, begins its life as a fledging, but, ma but matures and even develops a distinct personality over time. There's a table here, so chat, roll a d8 for me. We're going to use you guys. Six. Thank you, Dr. Cork. This is... So you can see there are th 
Uh, four different types. New, young, mature, and ancient. You roll the six. We have a mature community of a city that was actually planned and laid out, which is going to matter when you're trying to decide, oh, how does this go? So six. Mature community planned and laid out. And here they tell you, you know, what does that actually mean? New city is here. Young city is here. And then we rolled mature cities. Cities that stand the test of time becoming mature communities with considerable history have a lot of character. Architectural styles become strongly associated with such a place. Families that have lived there for many generations are frequently well-known and politically powerful. The city's reputation grows as it becomes known for specific cultural traditions, for unique or especially high-quality goods and services, and for famous individuals like powerful leaders, artists, and military minds. Monuments to heroes and mon momentous events decorate public spaces. A mature city has a distinct personality all of its own. So, that's true. That's not necessarily something you think about immediately. So what we could do here, here, let's create like three families super quickly. Uh, give me some names. So it's mature city. I want three families and we're going to just super quickly create some like in. I'm not sure what architectural style it would be, but somebody name any family, whatever you want, like a, a last name, Rosewood. Perfect. Look at that double rose, the Rosewood family known as the or, they were in the lumber business at the beginning as the founders and builders of the city, right? They imported. Perfect. You guys give us the architectural style. It's in deep, uh, deep brown, like rich wood. Uh, this this town um, still has a lot of wooden buildings uh, that are a deep, rich brown color. This family was responsible for bringing in the lumber and the old buildings downtown still have uh, the original beams and such before it became like all stone you know uh, and that reflect what am I thinking of is it the German style that has like the wood lattices kind of throughout that sort of vibe perfect Rosewood family done they're important uh, they have, maybe there's a statue, the statue of the eldest or the founder. Give me a name for like the elder Rosewood. Yeah, they can make this, exactly. Boom. We have a statue somewhere downtown of like the original founder, right? That's a monument. I want to have a monument. Archibald. Perfect. Archibald Rosewood has a statue in the downtown core um, area with... Uh, what does he have in it? He's, he's represented with like this big axe. Uh, he's got a big axe because that's what he used to cut down trees way back when. There we go. Done. Family number two. Tenway. Fine. Tenway. Done. Family number two. Mech family. Maybe we're going to skip mech family. We'll go with Wolfstone. Wolfstone family, they were the ones who provided food. They were the, oops, the original people that like hunted and did stuff. Provided food for the fledgling town back when. Or no, they were the defenders. The military family. Uh, they got in early in protecting the town and have historically been associated with the office of defense of the town right so they're sort of like the military might um police money they have a lot of money let's just say they have a lot of money wolfstone uh what's the the first you know what we'll say it was a uh the woman who was renowned for her military mind way back when and there's a statue of her with the archibald archibald's on one side of this uh it's a triangle there's Archibald, there's her, and then there's the, another person. Yeah, I mean, there we go. Like, look how much lore you guys are creating right there. So I need I need a, uh, a woman's name for the military mind. She's the one who defended the town. was like, you know what? No, we need to do this, this, this. And she laid out, like, the, the, um, the city walls. 
Noon Veil. The perfect. Noon the Veil. What's her middle name? I need a middle name. Nightwing. Noon Nightwing the Veil was a genius military um, mind that allowed the city to flourish uh, when it was surrounded by its enemies way back when. There we go. We don't need to be more specific than that. There's a statue to noon to the Nightwing. Night, noon Nightwing Veil. Um, where she is wielding a shield but no weapon. Defense. Um, nothing. And there's an inscription on her statue that says uh, maybe in like pseudo Latin or whatever that says, you know, these walls are impenetrable. You know what I mean? That's inviting enemies. And then the last family. One more family. We're just creating three quick families of this mature community. So we know that there's something to, to sort of latch on to. Johnson. All right, Johnson. Nice and basic. Johnson. So we have the military family. We have the builders. What is Johnson? What were the Johnsons about? Food production. The argue, we need we need food. We need to eat. These are the um, they provide the food. Food and trade. They're like the trading family, right? I think that kind of goes together. So they have the farmlands nearby uh, provided, and they, they're the ones who lighted sort of like guided the local cuisine, like all. The first crop they planted, the first Johnsons, uh, Dwayne the Rock Johnson, who planted. What's this? What's the um, region known for, food-wise, guys? Give me the cuisine. Tamako. What's tamako? I mean tobacco. I don't know what tamako is. Purple potatoes. Tomato plus tab tobacco. Addictive tomatoes? I'm going to skip on that. That sounds a little bit int intense, Pereira. Let's go um, planted the original purple potatoes leading to this region of the world. Uh, purple is everywhere. Um, developing, being known for their delicious patates. They invented french fries. This is where French fries come from, and they're called... We don't have a name for the city yet, but they... We need to invent the name of the city. Oh, boy. Let's let's give it... Um, you can't just... Not everything can be called Noonvale. Okay, we already have somebody called Noonvale. Can't just be Noonvale. What, what, what's the name of that street? Noonvale. What about this horse? His name is Noonvale, too. And this, that's also Noon Veil. Stop asking. It's all Noon Veils. Have I met Noon Veil? Wow. Evening Veil. All right. All right. Uh, since we're so focused on time, I don't know. Veil Haven. Done. Gaming consultant. Nailed it. Veil Haven. Love it. Veil Haven. That's the name of the town. Perfect. They invented... They're called... Uh, Valençois, Valençois. Ooh, that's so posh. The people who come from there are called... Not Vale Haveners. They're called... Valen, je, je ne suis pas... I am from Vale Haven. I am Valençois. That's so, that's so pretentious. I love it. AKA French fries. Okay. Uh, there's a... There's a statue of what's the what's the name of the Johnson leader? Valentians? Okay, Valentians. Valentian fries. I like it. Veil potatoes. Sir Frederick Steen Granta Moros Caris Johnson? No, I'm not I'm writing it down on the side right now so you guys can see, because look. I don't know. It looks I can't make it look nice. See? I don't want to cover. I can make it big. Look, I'm writing this down. Fine, I'll make it disappear when I'm done. The statue of uh, Frederick 
what is it? Frederick Gronta Johnson. Enough. That's enough. Uh, in the downtown area. And he is holding a potato peeler. No, he's holding a potato. Um, touching the potato. An expression in town. Touching the potato is an expression of good luck. In, in Vale Haven. People go and touch the potato. Right, he's holding a potato like this. And people come and touch the potato for good luck. And it's a become an expression in town. Ah, I gotta touch the potato, man. You touch uh, that guy touched the potato. If you win the lottery or something, I mean, he, he he touched he was touched by a potato. Nice. I'm skipping on Morris. There we go. Tater toucher. Exactly. All right, let's keep going. That was just from a D six D eight. You guys just reading through this. So let's keep reading. Very often, cities grow upward as well as outward. New buildings are built right on top of old ones. Streets become sunken or subterranean pathways as they wind below the newer surface levels. And more advanced construction techniques allow for taller structures that hold a commanding view in every direction or simply loom over the shadowed streets below. Some structures are abandoned but never torn down and they become a part of the background scenery. I mean, it's amazing. Just reading through this first bit, we've come up with a lot of things. Kissing the Blarney Stone, exactly. With touching taters over here. Tater touchers. That guy don't touch no taters. Come touch my tater. Whoa, calm down, dude. I don't know you that well. No, I have tater. Just come, you know, touch the tater. Um, okay, let's keep going. Chapter two, or no, chapter one, question two. What is the city's primary function? Roll a d20. Let's find out what the city's all about. Ten. Politics. The capital city of the realm. The city houses the rulers and hundreds of other politicians. All right. So, urban centers do not sp spring up randomly. A civilization needs a reason to settle in a specific area. Sometimes that reason is simply because it is a dry patch of land in a rather waterlogged region. Maybe it has easy access to fresh water. It might even be on the bank of a river or lake that makes travel and trade easier. Perhaps it is at the crossroads of two major trade routes, and it began as a tavern and stables for road-weary road -weary travelers to rest. I just love this. Um, so we rolled a d20, and we said, 10, this is the city, the capital city of the realm. Boom. All right. And as we scroll down, it tells you other questions that might be relevant. Does it have religious significance? Does it have signature goods? Potatoes. We talked about it. Tourism. Strategic value. Trade hub. Oh, we ran out of music. Let's get back in here. Um, and so those are all really important questions that we can ask ourselves, right? So we know that this city has potatoes. Like, they're famous for their potatoes. Uh, what do you call... So they, they, they have expressions all around potatoes, right? And politicians. If a if a politician sucks, or if a politician gets elected, he gets called a tater toucher. Right? Oh, that guy's a tater toucher. That's that's like not a bad thing. Being a tater toucher is not a bad thing. What would you call a politician that sucks and got elected? But like that's around oh he's he's such a tater. That guy that guy's mashed tater. Like nobody likes mashed potatoes out there. That guy's a baked tater. A skinner? A rotten tate? Rotten tape. I love it. Politician that sucks. That's a green... Oh, somebody who's new. Someone who's new. That's a green tater. It ain't right. It's not right. He got plucked too soon. That guy... Got, somebody who's an idiot around town or somebody who's a bit, like, touched. You know, like a bit goofy. That guy got plucked too soon. That guy's a green tater. You got... He done got tucked. You get... You got plucked too soon, buddy. Why don't you go back in the ground and, and you know, grow a little bit more. Uh, that guy's a moldy tater. <laughs> all right, we're just, it's all taters. It's all taters all the way down. Uh, yeah, that guy's a little, that guy's a little low on starch over there. That's hilarious. Oh, gratin. Kids are tater tots. Oh my God. I hate it, but I love it so much. 
Hey, did you drop off the kids at the daycare? Yeah, they're the tater tots. All right, cool. What's up, little tater tots? Today, for lunch, guess what? Yeah, we're having french fries. Or uh, Valencian fries. Yes, we are. Yes, we are, little tater tots. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, I love it. I love it. Rotten Tate, perfect. Or anyone who is generally uncool. Um, all right. Signature goods, we know what they are. Tourism. Why do people come here? I mean, the, we know it's the pol politician or the, the capital city. But why do people come here? The people, By the way, people outside of the city make fun of all these tater people, right? The history of the city, people are like, oh my god, I'm gonna... Are these, are these the potato lovers? Yeah, I gotta go trade with the Veilhaven. Oh my god, these guys are obsessed with potatoes. It's everywhere. I know. Tourists are spectators. Oh my god. Gaming consultant, please. Oh no. Tourists are spectators. And they make that joke all the time. And every time tourists go, oh my god. The guy, the tour guide, every time he makes a joke is like, oh no, don't say it. And of course we welcome our tourist friends, our spectators. Kill me. Kill me now. Please. No. That's awful. Uh, yeah. For sure. Exactly. Ha ha ha. I don't do I have wait, do I have a laugh track? One second, please. I might have a laugh track. I might just have a laugh track. Why is this what? Hang on. Oh boy, I crashed it. I was trying to do cool things. Oh wow, I really crashed it. Give me a second. We're gonna get it. We're gonna get it. I wanna get that. I wanna. I, it's important for me to get the laugh track. I demand it. Please, I need the laughs. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. So we know this is the pol political center of the town or the, the world. Or at least that kingdom. Let's keep going. Tourism. Uh, so signature goods, we talked about this. For us, it's food and it's potatoes. Strategic value. The area might have a high strategic value, whether mar martially or politically. Well, we know this is a politically high value statue, so the parliament's here. And we don't know what kind of political structure it is, but we know that the heart of the kingdom or of the realm is here. And so it has a very high strategic value. So we can write that down too. High strategic value. Important people live here, right? Okay. Oh, wait. Do we have... There we go. <laughs> Woo! We got it. Nice. Uh, we got it. We got it, boys. Hang on. I got a... Sitcom. There we go. This one. Uh, Dr. Quirk just showed up on set and people are super excited about it. How do I stop it? That was people were very excited about that. And Dr. Quirk just found the love of his life and they just kissed. Uh, okay, anyway, sorry. <laughs> All right, we're done. We're done. We're done. We're done. Aggritators? I mean, they could be. They could be. Okay, let's keep going. So what are the city's trade goods? Well, what is the treaty's... Right now, we know that they trade potatoes and wood. Still, it's both things, right? They're famous for the Rosewood family. Still harvest wood and the potatoes. So food and, like, building materials. We can ride... We can roll, though. If we're not sure... Roll, let's roll a D8 and find out. Six. Honey and mead as well. Perfect. Honey. Mead, right? Because you can make this. What type of region are we in? Let's... Wait, how many regions do they have listed here? A lot. 
One, two, three. Roll a D4. Let's find out what region we're in. I know Hemethal, I should have that in my pocket. But Hemethal, all my jokes land, dude. All of them. We're on the coast. And roll one more D4. What's up, Nick? One. And we also deal with abalone and pearls. Wow, okay. Abalone? How do you pronounce that? Abalone, right? And pearls. I think you say they eat. Abalone? I don't eat a whole lot of fish. Abalone. Because I got food poisoning from fish really bad one time. And since then, fish and me. Though I love sushi. Makes no sense. Abalone. What about, how, how do the British pronounce this? Abalone. Abalone. And the Americans? Abalone. Abalone. That sounds better than abalone. 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 Get out of my face, abalone. All right. Cool. Finally, we can also roll a D. Oh, no. This is a. Look at this. They give us a list of trade goods, which I think is excellent. A bologna. A, yeah. Bologna. Um, ah, baloney. So here we have a bunch of different, if you need help deciding, and I love that they also give us like scarcity. Like, is this something that is very, very available? Then a cask of ale is three gold pieces. Is this something that's like kind of difficult to get? Or is this something that's really hard to get? And there's your price point, right? Amazing. I don't have to do any math. It's in here. It's very good. It's very good. And it gives us a sense of economy, which is amazing. And the big, the only question I would have is these prices would vary, right? In our city, it's a big enough city. So I imagine some things are available, some things are not. But in a smaller town in the outskirts, we talked about this before, the economy of scale. Um, little tiny towns have no use for 500 gold pieces. What the hell is somebody going to do? If I present 10,000 gold pieces in a tiny town... I'm not gonna be able to spend that money because they have no there's nothing they can sell me for ten thousand gold pieces. They're gonna be more interested in trade services and exchanges. But if I go in a big city and have ten thousand gold, I can spend that money. It's something to keep in mind. Yeah, so all of this should be available for sure. Alright. What is the city size and population? Let's find out. Roll a D8, guys. I think it's gonna be a big city, but let's let's see what would happen. Three. Oh wow, it's a village. We can make this the capital village of a really small nation of 200 people. To me, that doesn't necessarily, that's a cool idea, actually, but to me that doesn't necessarily match up with what we're talking about here in a big city that's been established for a long time. I'm gonna say this is probably at least a large city, uh, but more likely a metropolis. So I'm gonna probably go with this as a big ass city. We got like, you know, 50,000 people living here. Claimed an Thanks, advantage. Nick. Um, capital, yes, like London, right? Isn't London that way? Maybe the English folk in chat can tell me. There's London, but there's actually the city of London. Isn't it like a tiny little district? Isn't that what it is? Like there's the official... So it could be the same thing where the the center of town is like a... Um, the Haven is actually the center of town, which is a small village of like 200 high profile politicians live there and that's like the name of the uh, political um institution the veil is the center of town the uh what's the word i'm looking for the parliament or whatever original city and the rest was built around it nice They're all potatoes. They're perfect. But yeah, isn't... I think pretty sure. And then the big Valencian potato famine hit, dude. Oh, no. All right, let's read about what they say about metropolises. Metropolises. The largest of the communities. Metropolises are few and far between and are often the capital cities of great nations or, or empires. Hey, look at that. That's what we're talking about. They're everything a city is just larger. These population centers are home to tens of thousands of people and sprawl across several square miles. Why miles? Just use kilometers. Most, I mean, why not base 10 stuff? Like, what are you doing with this miles? 
Never mind. Uh, it's like eight stones big, and if you tr walk 12 cheeseburgers this way, and nine, I don't know, fathoms that way, you've covered a mile. Just one meter, a hundred meters, a thousand meters. You've got your, just why? <sighs> Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Stop complaining, Rack. It's, it's okay. It's a losing battle. The largest... We, we did this already. We speak in freedom... I don't know, man. People do. It's funny. In Canada, they will sometimes use my... It's, it's weird. So, in Canada, they will say... In kilometers, right? Everything's kilometers per hour. It's kilometers. Because the metric system. But they'll weigh people in pounds. Why? Why am I in Canada like 145 pounds or whatever? Where, I, but we do things and it's, it's blah, it makes no sense. Just use kilos. What, why are we using like this half ass between system? Just kilometers and kilos. Just use the metric system in its entirety. Uh, Skula, I thank you for that bit of information. Um,. London is like where several villages effectively grew and merged. There, there we go. I knew a little bit of some. Wait, we're gonna we're gonna use the sitcom cheer for me here. Hang on. Woo! Where's the where's the cheer? I need I need the cheer. Oh, I can't find it. Isn't there a cheer? There it is. All right, we'll take those. Population density. The crowded conditions that exist within any fantasy, any fantasy city occur inside a metropolis too. As with cities, districts districts form in different parts, with often more pronounced, uh, eh, often even more pronounced due to the way that metropolises slowly enlarge and engulfs its constituent urban centers. The size of a metropolis also means that many citizens live within a single neighborhood or district for their entire lives and never even see the rest of the city. Due to the time required to travel from one section to another to another of a large metropolis, law enforcement and other civic services are likewise segmented to only attend to one region. Which makes a lot of sense, right? Like, if I'm looking at any fantasy city, I mean, if I want to look at the extreme example of a fantasy city, a megalopolis, that's Ravnica, right? And the MTG slash D&D lore, Ravnica is an entire plane that's just one big-ass city, right? It's the, the planet of Ravnica. And it's divided into five distinct like families and guilds that sort of run in areas there's no it's way more than this they're way more than that but there's the five what is it boros um simic combine there's rakdos there is the blue white people the azorius guild and there is another one the white orzov right those, those are the five combinations i think there might be more i just can't quite remember and um, those are the big sort of elements that sort of rule the city, right? Ten guilds? I can't remember. Is it ten? I just named like five. It's been a while. Been a while? I don't remember. Uh, we're looking at the brand new Cobalt Press book that just came out. It's each one for each combination. There you go. And... Um, it just really, it's not, it's in a pre-release, so I got, they sent me an early copy to review, which I'm doing, and I, we're building a city using it. It's the City and Town Builder, uh, and it's fantastic. I really like it. Okay, let's find out what type of government structure this is. Let's roll a D10 chat. I love this. This is so easy to go through. Yeah, I don't know when Black Flag comes up, but I signed up for the playtest, or I want to sign up for the playtest, rather. Six, this is a monarchy with a figurehead. We're literally making London. Okay. Uh, all right, so we, this is basically the UK. We have a monarch, uh, but that is a figurehead. Monarch, figurehead. You know what? I'm going to let you guys decide. I'm going to run a quick poll here. Is this a king, a queen, a prince? So in the real world, we have kingdoms. We have queendoms. So monarchies. So we've had the, the queen of England for a really long time. Rest in peace. Uh, I won't get into that whole, you know, a conversation. We have principalities like Monaco. We have... What other forms of monarchies do we have? Like, I don't know. So let's decide. What's the ruler? 
What type of ruler do we have? Is it a king? Is it a queen? Is it a prince? Is it a princess? Or is it a, a protator? Oh my gosh. You guys tell me, which of these four is it? And then we'll leave it at that. A hot potato? Let's decide. A queen? A princess? All right, this is some uh, Elsa stuff. What's up, Thamior? I see you there. All right. Princess it is. Done. Princess. And I know if I ask chat, it's Noonvale. It's just Princess Noonvale. It's not Princess Noonvale. What's the princess's name? It's not. I know. I know. Renee? Renee's the princess? Renee. Uh, West Wolf? I know. Well... Princess Renee Tanya uh, po Poopy Pr Renee Tanya something something Oh nice potentate I love it <laughs> Okay we've got our princess Um So she holds very little power obviously right little power for princess so let's read that section anyway about autocracies. If the city is ruled by a single individual, the chances it falls into this category. I love that they go through all these steps. It's so good. There are various levels of rulership in an autocracy, from figureheads who hold little actual power to absolute rulers who prescribe every law and punishment, but they're all totalitarian in nature. Such rulership is absolute and maintained through loyalty of martial forces to keep the citizenry in line. Uh... Rulers often rule capriciously, eliminating their political enemies and pronouncing edicts on a whim or to satisfy personal desires at the expense of the populace. All right, that's not the case here. There's a council, right? She's a figurehead, so there's got to be a council that's below that, right? So, the council of how many? Let's design a council really quick. Look at all these... I love this. This is prompting such a, a, a nice little thing. Council... How many people? Three, five hundred. Um, let's go with three. All right, three. I like the idea of three because we have the three original families, and maybe it's plucked from those three families, right? We had the, um, the original families that were like the Wolf's Bane. I can't even remember what we wrote. Wolfstone, Rosewood, and Johnson. So they're usually pulled from those. Usually taken from the original families. Uh, it's an honor. To serve on the council. Maybe three are like set in stone and it's five. And we have five uh, and two are elected officials from the city. People can run for uh, that job, right? I think that's a good idea. I like that idea. I'm going to keep that idea. So we've got Rosewoods. We've got the Johnsons. And we've got the Wolfstones. Cool. So we need two more. You missed not. What are entertainers called? PTubers? Get out of here. Get out of here. Uh, you. We need two more families. Who's currently... I don't know. Who's elected? I'm not sure. I'm going to pick, pick somebody from chat. I'm going to pick Hemethal is one of the rules right now. Uh, on the council. Hemethal. The... People like Hemethal. He's nice. He's he, But he's, you know... But he has a dark secret. He appears to be nice, but he has a dark secret. Hemethal, the over-nice, the benevolent. And he used religion as a crutch to get elected. Oh, boy. Okay. All right. Suddenly, I don't like Hemethal so much. He's high on his own. He's high on his own supply. You know what I mean? I'm so benevolent. Nobody is more, uh, nobody is more humble than me. Nobody is more religious than me. All right, that's Hemethal. Cool. Who else? Hootie. 
Hootie the Knight. What's up, Dragon? Hootie the Knight. Okay, cool. She used her millet. She, okay, Hootie went out to defend the city, some great adventure or something, and her people, all right, the reports and, and stories that people told of her made them elect her. She has a secret. Just this is for plot reasons. I don't know if we're ever going to use this, but she has a secret. All of those... Thank you for the follow, Dragon. All of those stories are fiction. She's a liar. She never did anything. She heard and collected... Oh my god, all of these stories. And then used it for herself. She's actually a bard. Oh no! She's a bard. And a liar. Oh my god. Oh my god. Hoodie, how could you? How could you be such a liar, dude? I'm shocked, I tell you. Let me put this down here, sorry. Under the alerts. Okay, perfect. Basically, yes, Australis. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. What a scamp! Report her to the police right now. The fictional police that we haven't established yet at all. But, you know, there would be. I like the idea that we could have had, like, a majocracy or whatever. You know what I mean? Uh, but that didn't quite happen. Oh, well. Ooh, my back. Um, okay. Let's keep going. We have democracy, uh, the pedocracy. Yes, we did this. Uh, we did one version of this where like it's the wise and smart people that rule, but we didn't do that. We did a, a other thing. All right. Next question is so we've answered the questions that are at the top here. Let's go back just to show you. So we're building a city using the new Cobalt Press book. Very good so far. The five questions. Which are here. Oh my god, Rack, what are you doing? Eh! The city's age, primary function, trade goods, size and population, and government structure. We've asked the five questions and we've answered them all. Then we have the the purpose the last thing we're gonna do is the level of magic. Which matters. So how much magic is there? And it's basically between the three. There are three levels of prevalence of magic. Everywhere, limited, and very restricted. So roll a d6. It's a d3. We're going to half it. Roll a d6, and we're going to decide how, ma how much magic there is. It is, man. Westwolf, it is. It is. It is. Six. Magic is severely restricted. Nice. Let's go down and take a look at what that means. So it, it tells you, by the way, with every section, it tells you about what happens in the background, how it impacts education, how it impacts healthcare, how it impacts entertainment, how it impacts food and nutrition and government, industry and commerce, transportation, public safety, utilities, sanitation. All of this is impacted by the amount of magic that you have which makes sense right like if you have magic everywhere nobody should be going hungry no one right so let's look at this in a restricted magic city magic belongs only to the elite magic is possibly even outlawed for use except by select few or might even be simply difficult to use and those who can wield it are rare there's a distinct divide between the districts of the city the upper class might have easy access to magical amenities but most of the population lives their lives without much if any contact with magic unless it is being used to control or oppress them those who do or are permitted to use magic often can be found as close advisors to the city's leadership or in position of power themselves enjoying the benefits of such privilege which is really really good only noon get new gets to do magic maybe so, in a city or setting where magic existed but is, is restricted to the elite, it would do well to lean into the inequality between the differing social classes. Absolutely. Depending on the character's introduction. And you could also have those her heroic characters that have access to magic and are well-loved by the population because they go and tend to them. 
So maybe Hamathal the Benevolent is well liked because he's a cleric and he goes out every day and he casts create water and food. And he's the only one who gives a crap about the poor. So maybe Hamathal is not that bad, right? He goes, I was like, all right, roll up my sleeves. I've got the acolytes. We're getting ready. We can only feed like 200 people out of 50,000. It's all we can do, but at least we're doing it. And that, therefore he's seen as like the man of the people. Right? Yeah, and then you can exactly, exactly. The potato mancer. So you can see how like just these prompts just cool. I have an idea. I know what's going on. It lets me to think and I can flesh out the story. And when my players arrive in the city, if they show up, oh, okay, I now realize that there's such a discrepancy um, in there. And it's, of course, of course, it's going to be difficult. You know what I mean? I, the, the inequality between people that have and have not is going to be enormous. Um, cool. In the background, scarcity or restriction. There are plenty of reasons why city has restricted magic. Environmental disruption might limit the availability of magic. The loss of many casters in a war um, or recent political upheaval could see a powerful faction of spellcasters hoarding magic for themselves. Maybe. Maybe it's going to be revolution. Who knows? If the issue is availability, then magic is restricted to the upper class because they're the only ones who can afford a singularly scarce resource. However, there's no law prohibiting generous cancers from helping the less well-off in such a circumstance. Magical infrastructure is unlikely simply because of the investment of magical resources it represents, and even the luxuries of the rich are likely purpose-made and at exorbitant expense. If the issue is purposeful class-based restriction, then magic is restricted to the upper class by design. Some sumptuary laws, licenses, cost minimums, or simple blanket bans might all exist to keep spellcasters from working for those deemed unworthy. So, uh, all or nothing, good, good question. Having one type of magic restricted, restricted doesn't mean others are. A city might restrict divine magic, yet allow arcane casters to operate freely. The city with a lack of sufficient connection to nature to maintain a circle of druids could have no such issue with bards. Where some magic is banned, casters might claim to be a legal spellcaster casting legal spells. That's cool to get a license, right? No evocation spells in town ever at all. But other ones are fine. Or no transmutation spells, because we don't want to transform this building into like an a tree ant by mistake. We don't want to summon fake creatures in town because it's always been a problem. When somebody summons a bunch of pixies, guess what? It leads to chaos. If you're caught summoning or conjuring creatures in town, believe it or not, straight to jail. Um it's Cobalt Press, Dragon. It's the Campaign Builder Cities and Towns. It's currently for pre-order, and it is released officially to everybody, I think, tomorrow. We just got an early copy of it. Uh, potato Bolt Casting. Duration Instantaneous. You create a bolt of energy that takes the shape of a potato and hurl it at a target of your choice. Make a range of spell attack. On a hit, the target takes 1d6 points of potato damage. No Nate, yeah. My potatoes. No druids touch my potatoes. This is all organic, all using manure, straight from the ground, purple original potatoes. And anytime there's like a potato contest and somebody wins the biggest potato, there are rumors. Do you hear about? Do you hear about Bragg? I heard that he used a druid to grow that potato to the size it was. I don't believe it for a second. That guy's cheating. What's up, Telly? There you go. So, we just created a whole bunch of things. Education. Magic schools of the existing setting are reserved for the elite and their children. Any magic and entertainment and leisure is reserved strictly for the upper class. The nobility might revel, revel in elaborate displays of the arcane while the rest of the population enjoys mundane performances. Sure, once a year maybe, there's a big festival where Gandalf shows up, smokes a pipe, and makes a dragon show up in the air of fireworks. That could be like a big thing for the population. Uh, a big, you know, celebration of the, the princess's birth. I don't know. The Harvest Fest, exactly. Any other spell casting would eventually trigger a reaction with the Mage Council? 
You could eventually buy a license? Yeah. Uh, what else do we need to worry about? Food and nutrition. With magically tightly controlled, any form of conjured food is a sign of privilege. Nobles can enjoy conjured delights. Supernaturally filling and delicious fruit fed to them by the platter or mundane foods gifted with impossible flavor by magic. Uh, so birdie bots every flavored beans is a delicacy. Good berries are super rare and very, very worthwhile, right? To feed a person off a berry. Mm. This, this good berry tastes like licorice. Yuck, I hate licorice. I love licorice. You're stupid. This one tastes like pickles. We love pickles. Uh, yeah, we did climate early on. We said it was a coastal region, but climate... Mm -hmm, what a question. You'd have to get the book to find out more about it. There's a whole section in chapter 2? Let me show you. I'm trying to I'm trying to get you guys to... If you want to buy it, I think it's worth it. Um, let me go back up. Where are you at? It was under... I think it's chapter 2. Climates. Yes, right here. And you can roll for it. Arid, continental, uh, planar, on a plains, polar, temperate. Right, you can roll a d6. Or a d8, actually. Roll a d8. Roll a d8 right now. And I'll tell you what climate it is. I don't know. It's coastal, though. Boom. We are... Uh, oh, shoot. We're planar, not continental. Like, as in... Impacted by fiendish plane. Oh boy. Otherworldly shenanigans. That's not what I expected. Uh. Alright, well that's dangerous. Devils show up randomly. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Maybe that's why Hootie, or not Hootie, that's why the original family was so famous. They built walls around the city that protect them from fiendish incursions. Um... How much it costs? I don't know. You know what? Let me look at the email they sent me. And I'll tell you. I think it's either... I don't want to say the wrong price. It might be like $29 or $39.99. Let me click it. $29.99 USD. $29.99. So, if I go, uh, where is it? It's called Campaign Builder Cities and Towns for 5th Edition for Kickstarter. I'll try to find, oh, I have a link. Hang on. Do I have a link to this? I have a referral guide, but I'm not sure if it's the actual link. Um, it's due to hit retail next month and be released on the Cobalt press site next week so next week so there you go today is the day that it goes out to the Kickstarter um, to the pre-order audience goes out today so I wasn't allowed to talk about this until today and today I'm allowed to talk about it um, yeah there you go so $29.99 and it's 250 pages I really, I really like it. I mean, I, like, like I said, yesterday I was like, I'm going to look at it for 10 minutes and then see if it's... And then an hour and a half later, I'm like, oh my god, it's 11.30, I got to go to bed. I got really engrossed with, like, all the things they had in here. Like, I genuinely, genuinely like it. Uh, magic can have corrosive effect on organic matter, including plants. Whenever a spell is cast, it unleashes a burst of chaotic magical energy. The more powerful the spell, the greater the effect on the plants. Yeah. I think it's really good... It was West Wolf. I think it's really good also for any other system. Like, right now, nothing that's been in here, though the subclasses have D&D specific things, nothing that's in here is specific to Dungeons & Dragons. This is like a really handy guide to world building. You're in the future now? All right. That's fine. You don't have to. I'm not, you know, I'm just excited about it. If I go to my account, I have like a referral guide somewhere. There we go. If you guys want to go and check out my referral URL. Is here. I don't know. Boom. There. 
Um, yeah, I get up, at, I, I go to bed. Like, normally I go to bed by like 10, 10, 30. Sometimes 11, but I was up to like 11, 30 midnight last night just reading this. Okay. We were at limited magic and what impact it has on... We had looked at... All right, let's look at government. When magic is tightly controlled, those who display an aptitude are often found at the top tier of society and in powerful governmental roles. A monarchy with restricted magic likely has at least one arcane advisor who is a powerful magic user. It's Hamathal. A city council might be made up entirely of arcane practitioners, even if most of the populace has no access to magic. For us, it's just Hamathal, the cleric, because magic casters are not trusted. Healthcare. Magical healing might be available for the upper class in a way that is not in the poor districts. Right, this is a thing that we struggled and thought about a lot ourselves. If healthcare is around and people are sick, in a setting like Eberron where magic is everywhere, I could probably just pop down to the mage right and be like, I broke a bone, mending, heal, all right, thanks for the two gold pieces, get out of here, I fixed your bone. But in a place where there's no magic, if you have, you know, you catch the plague or a disease, how do you deal with it? You know, do people, uh, how do you deal with the common cold? Do you just work it out and they let it run through the city because they can't? If somebody suffers a burn, like, how do you do all this, right? So if magic is repressed, is science accelerated? Maybe alchemy. Maybe there's a place for alchemy, Australis. Perhaps, you know, you're not wrong. Maybe uh, potion makers. Maybe there's an underground market for potions. Right, magic is tightly controlled. Maybe there's a whole black market for healing potions and you don't know what you're getting. Maybe you're getting like a really good healing potion. Maybe it's a healing potion cut with like poisons and you die. Right? Like sort of weird drug market. You don't know the purity of it. You have no idea what you're ingesting, but you're willing to take the risk. So I think it's really, really interesting to ask these questions. Um... Well, restrictions are still possible. Where magic is scarce or restricted, magical healthcare might serve as the carrot in a system full of sticks. Temples might open their doors to heal all, the, all comers on holy days, while charity healing is heralded as a noble largesse. Right? So maybe the clergy in town uses healing as a stick. Or like, come and worship at the altar of Tyr, and you get healing. But I don't believe in Tyr. Well, then no healing for you. Fine, I love Tyr. He's the greatest. All right, here you go. Do you mean it? I mean it. Well, maybe you should give a little bit of tithing because we like money and we can't do our charitable works without a little bit of money. And all of a sudden, the clergy is getting more and more powerful because money. Right? I'm just saying. That makes a lot of sense. If you want to make it like a religious faction that's maybe not up to super generosity out of the goodness of their own heart, I'm looking at you. Um... You know, uh, what was it? The pardons that they used to sell in Europe, right? In the medieval times? Oh, you committed some crime? Just listen. Give me like 200 silver. I'll write you a little note that says that God forgives you. The Catholic Church forgives you. Here you go. Here's your little pardon. Go do whatever the hell you want to do. You're fine. Just pay it off. Yeah, the clergy has gone to God. That's it. Um, okay, cool. Industry and commerce, we're almost done. If magic is limited to the elite, only the elite enjoy its benefits in their industries and commerce, right? If I want to make a really cool, magically enhanced set of goods, my products are enchanted, I'm going to charge a premium for it. Public safety. The power of the city watch in the restricted magic city can vary greatly depending on its purpose. If, it, if the watch exists to uphold the status quo, its members might be equipped to handle any rogue arcane practitioners. Or perhaps they only have mundane equipment since any weapons used against criminal magic users can also be turned against any of those in power. I like the idea of having different... Maybe, if magic is restricted by law, the upper class may keep private proofs of magically equipped guards. Yes, this is more uh, what I would see happening here. Large, rich, elite families have their own police forces. So the Rosewoods have their own police forces, the Johnsons have their own police forces, the Noonvales have their own police forces, right? All of them have their own guards that use magic in a very aggressive way, I would say. That's it, Dragon, for sure. 
Sanitation throughout a restricted magic city is often mundane. Sludge filled sewers beneath the streets and trash collectors carts rumbling down the alleyways. The upper class districts, however, probably have like magically taken care of stuff like prestidigitation, prestidigitation or a way to get rid of their, you know, crap. Um, one thing that I like to use is the magical chamber pots. Uh, I use that in almost all my adventures because I really like the idea. So tanners uh, and other, you know, farmers want the manure. They want the crap. They want the pee. They, they tan hides. They do. There's a lot of process that you do with the, uh, the what is it? I can't remember the, the component in urine that people will extract for tanning um, and other processes. So wouldn't there be easily there would be a uh, an individual who's magically competent as ammonia. Thank you. That'll basically take a chamber pot of the rich and you pee or you poo in it and it magically transports it into heaps. So it's a, it's a, not conjuration, transmutation. I don't know what the spell would be, what spell school that would be. Uh, but it takes that stuff and it moves it magically to where it needs to go. So every rich family has a chamber pot of, you know, transportation or whatever. And that pee and poo just magically goes to the mittens and the piles they need. They charge a premium for it. So they sell you the chamber pot for X amount of money because it doesn't smell in your house. And then they charge the farmers and the tanners that money for the pee and poo because they have use for it. I've never seen the movie Envy. I have not low fat. Just outside the city limits, kind of like living in a drought county in the US, maybe. But I've, no, I've not seen Envy. <clears throat> so there you go. I think that makes a lot of sense for sanitation. Transportation in a restricted magic setting. Magical transportation is limited to those in power and to perhaps the upper echelons of society. Horseless carriage. Um, but teleportation is only available to those at the very top. And any permanent circles are likely closely guarded. Airships, if they exist at all, are only for the rich and powerful. Otherwise, you're walking horses, horse... Yeah. When you see, like, a carriage that comes by without a horse, people are like, Oh, man. Get out of the way. That person has money. An, an airship is like, you see that once every, you know, X amount of time. But like being in the capital city, maybe once a month is an airship that comes in. It's always a big deal. People are like, oh, that's cool. Okay. We can, oh, there. We can determine the level of magic. We did it that way. But you can also, there's a table. Look at this. Roll a D100. You have a bag of pooping? True. Colostomy bags, right? 21 this would have been everywhere look floating platforms convey large shipments to various points in the city without clogging the surface streets if we had a high magic city that's what we would have gotten because we did restricted let's roll a d10 in the restricted table and we'll find out something specific one magical statuary like animated armor or stone golems stand guard in front of the homes at Ooh, and government buildings. Nice. That's terrifying. In a city where you have very little magic, there's a constant reminder of stone golems walking around. Move on, citizen. Like an evil Robocop just standing there and staring at you, watching you all the time. Dude, I don't want to live there. That's, that's kind of terrifying. And there you go. It's cool, right? And then we have chapter two, which is the anatomy of a city to tell you how to build the city, the climates of the city. Um, there is, let's just look at the titles. It's so good. Like overall, I'm going to, I'm going to make it, I'm going to try to trim this down to YouTube video, but like overall, every chapter, we just went over chapter one, answer the questions. Every chapter is filled, completely filled with amazing prompts that really help you logically work your way through a city. And at the end of which, you end up with a really living, breathing city. If you take an hour, you know, I'm doing this online, so it's taking some time. If I did it by myself, pen and paper, and just roll the dice, I would get a city fully fleshed out with rulers, districts, climate, architecture, uh, the inhabitants, the guilds, the, the uh, city campaigns, like what adventures might await players when they arrive in the city, the heroes that exist in here, relationships, backgrounds and player options i could get that done in an hour we have naming tables urban encounters we have examples of, of towns and metropolises battle maps 
just absolute absolute value for 29.99 30 bucks us i think you really really get your money's worth out of this i'm not being paid to do this by the way like they gave me a number they gave me a free copy of this i'm not getting paid there's no money i don't get any kickbacks i'm just telling you this is really good it's really well written and i think i think it's well worth it all right we're going to look at one of the player options uh or one of the we have player backgrounds I, di I did not look in the midwife. Let's go look in the midwife because I'm kind of curious. From an early age, mentors trained you in the skills of midwife midwifery. You witnessed many births and later accompanied others as you became practiced in the art of delivering children and providing comforts and calm words. You bring in the tater tots. Choose how you came to learn your skills. Were you raised within a community where midwifery was a respected tradition? Do you practice the arts as part of your religious duties? Were you appointed to the task by a wealthy merchant? You have proficiencies in medicine and persuasion, healer's kit and herbalism kit, and feature. As a midwife, you hold the respect and gratitude of the families you helped. Your skills make you and your companions welcome in nearly every community. If you help an individual deliver a healthy baby, that individual compensates you to the best of their ability is appropriate to their social standing. The GM decides the nature of the compensation. For example, a poor family might gift you with a basket full of fresh vegetables. That's really cool. This is, yeah, exactly. This is very, very cool. Uh, we get, per let's roll a D8 for personality and then a D6 for uh, ideal. Yeah, I guess so, Break. The three st statues, for sure. Three and eight, four. So, I'm sometimes filled with a longing to reconnect with the children I've helped birth, feeling uncertainty about my own legacy and impact on the world. Amazing. I love this. And then the D6 was a 3. I shall offer whatever comfort I can to those suffering and mourning or grief of a lost child. Oof. That's that's difficult. For me as a parent, that's oh, that's tough. Um, but that's true. That's true to form. Bond. Let's roll another D6. Two. Years ago, I delivered a child I believe might have been possessed. Oh, damn. I have a whole arc right here. And one more D6. It's amazing. There's a possessed baby running around. Two, I'm envious of the lives of wealthy children and expect that as adults, they should repay me for my help. Okay. So there you go. Very cool, very cool background. Uh, all right. Which player... Op we we took an hour and a half. I wanted to spend an hour on this. We're gonna have to go long today, because we're gonna do it some Dungeons and Dragons and Dark and Darker mix, um, in a little bit. This took way longer than I thought, but it's well worth it. I'm really happy with this. Um, ba -ba 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 -bum. all right, we can look at which which subclass. What subclass do you want to look at? We can look at one. Uh, we have the druid. Or we have the cleric. No, the bard. College of Chicanery. We have the Cleric, Community Domain. We have the Druid, Circle of the Sewer. We have the Fighter, the Rake. We have, nope. Um, we have the Monk, the Parkour Monk, Leaps and Bounds. We have the Paladin, Revolution. We have the Ranger, the Urban Ranger. We have the Rogue, which is the Skirmish Surgeon. And we have the Wizard, which is Street Magic, David Blaine. How do you spell Blaine? I don't know. We're going to write it this way. I don't remember. Which one do you guys want to look at? Vigilante is a background. Yeah. But I, you're going to have to be have to get the book to find out. Wes, what are we going to have to book to find out? Sewer Druid is three. Yeah, if you want to look at that one, just three, and then we'll vote for that and go look at it. All right, we're looking. Oh, it's a close vote between Druid and Rogue. Let's start with the Druid. The Druid Circle of the Sewer. 
Jurors of the Circle of the Sewer convene in an unlikely spot. Underground in the city's sewer and drainage systems. Uh, what's that name of the Rav Ravnica guild that's like dirty and with like Jethro Tull who leads it, whatever his name is? I've got the Ravnica book. What's their name? Excuse me. All about rot and stuff? Ravnica, where you at? Hmm, where's the book? No, I don't want Van Richten's. Uh, oh my gosh. Ravnica. Give me a second. Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. I have the book behind me. Not Grohl. Is it Golgari? It might be Golgari. I think it's Golgari. Yeah. Okay, it sort of gives me Golgari vibes. Yeah, that's it. Um, outside the thank you. Outside the attention of the city's d citizens, those waterways are a bizarre reassertion of natural order, and Druids of the Circle commune with, study, and emulate this unique water. The Circle meets in the slu s Sluiceways? Is that how you pronounce it? I never know. I've seen this word a million times. I've never pronounced it out loud. And channels underground and its forgotten streams of rainwater and refuse, where the whole ecology flourishes beneath civilization unknown and disregarded. Drown form. When you join the circle at second level, you learn to adopt a watery drown form. You can use a bonus action to expend over your use of wild shape feature and suffuse your body with water and muck rather than transforming into a beast form. Yuck! While in your drown form, you retain your game statistics and look drenched, pallid, and covered in muck with webbing between your fingers and toes. Ew! Gross! Asher Draven 2022. Welcome to the workshop. I appreciate the follow. Uh, that's so gross. You have a swimming speed equal to your walking speed and can breathe air and water. Simic vibes. In addition, you're immune to disease. I have advantage on saving throws against poison and have resistance to poison damage. Cool. There's not a whole lot of disease in the game. It sounds OP at first glance. Not a whole lot of diseases in 5e. So I don't think it's that strong. But it's kind of strong. A resistance to poison damage, you wouldn't be the first. Poison is resisted by, like, literally everything. You're fine. Uh, this is sort of like dwarf vibes. A dwarf that has... I don't know. Yeah, it could be a swamp druid, too. Exactly. You can stay in your drowned form for 10 minutes or until you dismiss it or incapacitated to die or use this feature again. When you reach 10th level in this class, you can stay in your drowned form for up to an hour until you dismiss it. In addition, your swimming speed equal... Speed equals double your walking speed and you're immune to poison position and poison damage. Cool. At second level, you can use an action to taste water, such as a runoff from a storm flood or street washing, and glean some insight into recent events. Ew. Ugh, that's so gross. Blah. Blah. That's just so nasty, dude. You can question the water about events that happened within the past hour within 60 feet of where you tasted the water, gaining information about creatures that have passed, weather, and other circumstances. This information comes to you in the form of a brief vision of a recent happening, the whispered sounds of voices that spoke near the water, or a similar conveyance, rather than the water speaking directly to you. You could have four turtle monk cohorts, too. Hand fire? You're not wrong. Yeah. Mmm. I taste the ammonia in it. Delicious. This person's begin having a lot of asparagus, or they're having a prostate problem. When you reach 12th level in this class, you can use this feature while touching of body water and learn the general appearance of the most recent creatures with an intelligence of 6 of higher that came into contact with that body water within the past 24 hours. If you use this feature on a particular large body water, such as an ocean or river, you can only learn of creatures that came into contact with the water within one mile of where you touched the water. You can do this once per short rest. I mean, it's really flavorful. I really, really like this. My throat is killing me today. All right, you know what? I'm going to go get a quick drink of water. I'm going to leave this up for you guys. I'll be right back. Chair stream for like a minute. BRB.
Our hero has claimed an advantage. This advantage has been claimed. All right, all right. <clears throat> this is what I meant, right here. Mm-hmm. That's that's the breakfast of champions right here. Man, Gert sucks. M -m 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 maximum. Damn. If you guys uh, don't know, acid reflux sucks. Okay. You eat, like Skittles, dude, it's brutal. By 6th level, your exposure to the often polluted or refuse filled water within the city has infused or drowned form with the power of poison. When you're hit with a melee attack with a creature within 5 feet of you while you're in their drowned form, the attacker takes poison damage equal to your proficiency bonus. Nice! A poison shield. In addition, while in your drowned form, you emit a rotten, mildewy stench. Ew. Ew. Um, a creature that starts its turn within five feet of you must succeed on a con saving throw against your spell save DDC or be poisoned until the start of the next turn. Oh, that's cool. Actually, that's a really neat idea. I like that a lot. Poison has a very specific effect in 5e, by the way. For those of you who don't know, I'll read it to you. But it's very, very strong, actually. Um, so there has disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks, not saving throws. So this is actually really potent and you're sort of like, I guess you're tanking, right? This, the role of this druid with a shield, like I would literally walk, I'm trying to understand like how you play this druid, right? You have high, I think this is a high con druid. Wisdom is whatever, like obviously you want wisdom, so wisdom con druid. And you walk in the middle of other fighters or the enemy. You use your drown form to emit this like aura of death. And if they hit you, they take poison damage back. Right? So I'm just literally walking as a tank in my drowned form going, you know what? Get poisoned. That's kind of cool. Discard knowledge. At 10th level, you learn how to tap into the knowledge contained within the waste-filled waters that flow through and beneath civilization. You can perform a 10-minute ritual while partially submerged in a body of water that has been substantially used by civilization, such as a sluice in a sewer, a city pond, or a fountain, a river running through town, or similar. How do you pronounce this word? It's going to annoy me. Let me just make sure I get that. Sluice way. Sluice way. Sluice way. All right. Nailed it. Uh, so, the water must be deep enough to cover at least half your body. Once the ritual is complete, the water reveals to you some bit of knowledge contained with the waste filling it, granting you one of the following benefits. You can read, write, and speak a language you don't know. You are proficient in one skill or artisan's tool of your choice. You can choose a cantrip you don't know from any spell list. This cantrip is a druid spell for you. Wow. Wow. Thank you for the follow. Blood of a Valkyrie. A bit dark. But that is a very cool. I love this. Fluid Flesh. By 14th level, your drowned form becomes more like animated water, transforming you to an avatar for the city waterways. While in your drowned form, you can move through a space as narrow as one inch wide without squeezing. When you transform into your drowned form, you can choose whether your equipment falls to the ground in your space, merges into your new watery form, or is worn by it. Worn equipment functions as a normal, but the GM decides whether it is practical for the equipment to move with you if you flow through particular narrow spaces. What's up, Lazy Amber? Yeah, you're basically running around throwing poop at people. That's, I love it. I'm, you know, I'm, the child in me is saying every time you take a step. <laughs> oh no! Kevin the <laughs> Kevin the sewer druid's showing up. What's up, everybody? <laughs> I'm sorry, I had a little bit of uh, poop water for lunch, and so I'm farting a lot now. I'm really gassy. All right, who invited Kevin? Guys, who invited Kevin? Kevin, get out of here. Uh, yeah, basically. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Wait, no, we don't want to get DMCA'd. Uh, adolescent mutated tortoises of martial prowess. That that rolls off the tongue. 
In addition, while in your drowned form, you can use an action to spin yourself into a watery tornado to enter the space of a larger, smaller creature within five feet of you. The creature must make a strength saving throw against your spell save DC. So I'm making a poop tornado? Uh, on a failed save, the creature takes bludgeoning damage equals to 2d8 plus your wisdom modifier and is restrained by the force of your spin. While restrained, the creature is unable to breathe unless it can breathe water. On a successful save, the creature takes half damage and isn't restrained. Okay. So basically, I'm, I'm picturing a poop tornado. So we're turning into sort of like a poop water elemental, right? I mean, is, isn't that basically what we are? If you summon an earth golem, if you summon an earth golem, it's just like the poop demon from um, Dogma, right? A creature that starts its turn restrained by you in this way takes poison damage equal to twice your proficiency bonus. The restrained creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns. On a success, it frees itself from your grasp and ejects you in an occupied space. Okay, you must use a bonus action on your subsequent turns to continue spinning and keep the creature restrained. If you don't, the effect ends. What level do you get this? At 14th level? All right. The other one you guys wanted to look at, we're going to look at both of them, was the Rogue. There's our Revolution guy, our Urban Ranger, and you guys wanted to look at the Rogue of Skirmish Surgeon. Manda Mandy, it evolves quickly from building a city to poop demon. What do you want? What do you want me to tell you? And these are the player field, the player uh, options, and one of them is a sewer druid, which is really cool. I actually really like it. Uh, it's just we, you know, a little bit poopy themed. Roguish archetype skirmish surgeon. You've dedicated. I, I would. So I've built a skirmish surgeon or a field surgeon before. I never thought to use a rogue. It was either a bard or it was a cleric, but I like the idea of the skirmish surgeon being a rogue. So let's see how they've done it. You've dedicated yourself to watching over your comrades in battle and pelting your foes with dangerous concoctions. So it's sort of like alchemy vibe. You keep a steady hand amid the chaos to practice life-saving techniques while mitigating the taxes they leave on the body. When you're not playing the doctor, you fight with a blade in one hand and bottle disaster in the other. Okay. When you choose this archetype, you gain proficiency in the medicine scale if you don't already have it, and you gain proficiency with alchemy supplies or the herbalism kit. You can also use the bonus action graded by your cunning action to make a medicine check on yourself or one creature within five feet of you. Plague Doctor? Mm, I wouldn't, eh, maybe, I don't think so. Never mind. Plague Doctor, I'm like, no, instantly go down. Oh yeah, okay, literal Plague Doctor being depicted here. Ooh, I'll say this, people don't know this. The Red Cross logo is a protected logo. Uh, the Red Cross, in the US is allowed to be used by Johnson and Johnson and the Red Cross. Everywhere in the world, everywhere else, everywhere else in the world, the Red Cross is very much a protected logo. So they should not be using this here. I know it's incomplete at least, but just so they know, that is um, not something you should use. You can use the inverted one, which is green and white, and that's fine, but I know this because work. Uh, but anyway, anyway, just if you ever, if it ever comes up in Trivia Night, you now know that this is a protected uh, emblem. For good reason. I mean, it kind of... You don't know if it's a cross? It looks like literally the plus sign, right? I understand that they're cutting it off, which is fine, but like... You yeah, know. You yeah, know? Just so you know. It doesn't... I mean, it doesn't matter, but just... If you ever come up with a design for a game and you use that, you shouldn't. Uh, yeah, plenty of video games get in trouble over it. Anyway, it's not the end of the world. But it's in, just, yeah, but whatever. Field Surgeon, we know this. Bloodletting, starting at third level, you understand the precise cuts in the body can be just as effective as helping, at helping as harming. You can use the medicine skill in the following additional ways. Bleed the vein. You deal 1d4 piercing damage to yourself or a creature within 5 feet of you and make a DC 15 wisdom check. Medicine. On a success, you end one of the following conditions affecting the target. Incapacitated, paralyzed, or poisoned. Ooh, I like this. Oh man, that's brutal, dude. We really are a plague doctor. 
Really? Among Us got done for it early on? I didn't know that, Blood. I did not know that. Good to know. See, I'm not... I'm, let, I'm telling you. I know this because for 10 years I had to work with the Red Cross. And that was one of the conditions. And that came up often. And there was a whole department... A whole department. A whole two people... They would check and be like, can you, and they would ask, it was never like a threat of a lawsuit. They would send an email explaining, hey, this is a protected thing. Uh, if we don't try to protect our, the, the, the emblem, uh, then it becomes something that anybody can use. Can you please change it? It's covered on the, I think it's the Geneva Convention or whatever. And for a good reason, and people are like, oh, you're being over the top. Not really, because by law, if you don't defend your copyright or the logo trademarks or whatever, that means that anybody can use it. So you have to defend it so that when people go in the field during times of war or times of rescue, they know that this is not somebody pretending to be a Red Cross employee or Red Crescent employee or whatever. Um, it's actually legitimately somebody trying to help. And this is how you otherwise you end up with a bunch of dead, you know, aid workers and nobody wants that. So it sounds like really trivial until you finish the thought and you work your way through and go, OK, maybe they shouldn't. Um... So yeah, in the U.S., Johnson and Johnson owns it, uh, and the Red Cross because they were they got it before. But it was what's his name? I can't remember the name. Uh, the guy, and he's a Swiss guy in 1918, 1917. I can't remember his name. Who um, took the Swiss flag and inverted the colors, basically, and used it as a symbol of like we're going out there to help. I forget his name, but that's that's basically where it comes from. Anyway. Field patch. You tie a tourniquet, wrap a wound, or perform some other quick patch up to yourself for a creature within 5 feet of you that is below half its hit point maximum. Make a medicine check and consult the table below to determine the effectiveness of the patch up. Roll a d20. Four. The target, man, don't be coming healing me, low fat. Your patch up sucks. I lost a D4 hit points, dude. Nuh-uh. So if you succeed, if you fail, they lose a D4. If they, if you go to 16 to 15, they regain um, a minor amount of temp hit points. A better success is a more amount of temp hit points. And a big success is actual hit points. It's not temp hit points anymore. Which sometimes you want temp hit points more than the other. Anyway. There we go. There we go. Captain Dwilla, please come to my rescue. We can't be having people just randomly stabbing me in the gut, calling it healing. By third level, your time in medical tents and tending wounded on the battlefield has taught you how to handle and distribute alchemical substances. Such as, uh, you are proficient with improvised alchemical weapons, such as vials of acid, alchemist fire, holy water, jars of leeches. When you hit a creature with an improvised alchemical weapon, you can deal your sneak attack damage to it, provided you meet the normal requirements for dealing your sneak attack damage to the target. If the alchemical weapon requires target to make a saving throw, the DC equals 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your wisdom modifier. Sneak attack, bucket of leeches, yikes. Uh, by 9th level, oh, there's a typo here. By at 9th level, by 9th level, you're adept at switching between patching wounds and causing them. If you successfully use your bloodletting feature on yourself or, or a friendly creature to end one condition or provide temporary hit points or healing, you have advantage on the next attack roll you make before the end of your next turn. Nice. At 13th level, you can provide others with therapeutic treatment to help them ward off illness and injury. You can spend at least 10 minutes tending to the medical needs of up to six friendly creatures, which can include yourself, bolstering their body's natural defenses. Each creature gains temporary hit points equal to your proficiency bonus and has advantage on con checks and con saving throws for an hour. A creature can't benefit from preventative care again until it's finished a short or long rest. Really nice. Uh... That's really cool. If you know you're about to go into battle, you do this as prep on a short rest. It doesn't really cost much of anything. And you give them advantage on the con sec check and saving throw. Why not? I like this. Jar of leeches. This small glass jar is filled with leeches. As an action, you can throw this jar up to 20 feet, shattering it on impact. Make a ranged attack against a creature, treating the jar of leeches as an improvised weapon. If the jar hits a creature that isn't a construct or undead, the target takes 1d4 piercing damage, and at the start of each of its turns, it takes 1 piercing damage as the leeches stick to the target and continue biting it. 
A spellcaster covered in leeches has a disadvantage on con saving throws to maintain concentration on spells. A creature can, this, can end this effect by using its action to make a DC 10 dex check to scrape off the leeches. Alternatively, the leeches can be used to aid in medical procedures. The leeches have 10 uses. When you make a wisdom medicine check, you can expend one of this one use of this jar to give yourself advantage on the check, provided the check involves blood and wounds, stabilizing or treating a disease or poison. If the jar has five or fewer uses remaining, you can't make an attack with it. Nice! I love this. Here we see a picture of somebody being bled, their humors or whatever. And one more feature at 11th 17, you learn to exploit weaknesses by reveal um you learn to exploit weaknesses revealed by your alchemical substances. If you hit a creature with an improvised alchemical weapon within the last one minute, your sneak attack damage against that creature increases by 3d6. Nice. Alright, chat. That was it. That was our early review. So, in summary, let me do a quick thoughts. The Kobold Press book of the Campaign Builder Cities and Towns, which has also subclasses in it, is really, 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 really tuned and good. Let me just get to see all of this, all in its glory. It was a camp, a Kickstarter campaign book. It's being released to the backers today. It's going on their store next week at the time of filming of this uh, video. And it's for $29.99 USD. You get 250 pages. We just went over building a city in chapter one and in chapter two, three, four, just 250 pages of goodness, climate, uh, people that live there, adventures, heroes, uh, just everything to build a city from the smallest little town to the biggest metropolis, all of it's contained in here. I really, really like this. Yeah, 2099 is the PDF. That's right. That's right. I don't know if there's a hard copy of the book. I don't know. Uh, I always get the PDFs these days because I lose books all the damn time. $49.99. A bit expensive? Fair enough. I just think there's a lot of value here. Like, it's, it's you know, Cobalt Press usually puts out really good stuff. And as always, um, just really good. It's a very good DM resource. Yeah. If the players want to get it, I still think there's value in it. As a player, just to get the backgrounds and the new ba uh, the new subclasses. There's also magic items and spells in here. Um, you get tables and just very, very good. I'm, I'm very, you know, I, the code was, again, I'll say this again. This was given to me for free. I'm not getting paid to review this. Um, there's just like, hey, do you want to look at it? Yes, I do. And I really like it. If they hadn't given it to me for free, I would have probably gone out and picked it up for 20 bucks or 30 bucks. And they occasionally have deals on their books too. So you can always wait for like a humble bundle that may contain this eventually but I think it's well worth it.